Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which each of us are on. I pay respect to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging, and I celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal cultures and languages across Australia. I am on Gad uh, Gadigal country, and I invite each of you to acknowledge the country where you are. My name is Christine, and I'm the supervisor of events and marketing for Randwick City Library. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome best-selling author Kyle Perry and Catherine Dupreleu Menage, who is the director of the Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival here tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Kyle and Catherine are here to talk about Kyle's latest heart-stopping thriller, The Deep, which has just released a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations, Kyle. Um, Thank you very I know much. it's fresh off the, the printing press, as they say. Yeah. If you have any questions for Kyle or indeed Catherine this evening, just type them into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and we will get to them towards the end of the hour. Um, so Catherine, without further ado, I am going to hand over to you. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm talking tonight from Gadigal land, but I've been spending um, most of my lockdown on Darug land. So that's a I've come into Sydney to, to Gadigal land to do this event, whether because the internet is more reliable here. Um, it's a great <laughs> pleasure to meet Carl. I read um, The Bluffs when it came out last year and loved it. And a year later, there's another book. This is really good. We had been going to meet in person, but you know, we've got used to the fact that this is just as good, differently good, yeah, I think. That's exactly right. Yeah. Look on the positive side. Welcome, Kyle. So I'll just say a little bit about you. Um, Kyle, your background and what you still do is work in drug and alcohol counselling of different kinds, and we might well talk about that. But um, your first book was published last year to huge acclaim. I'll raise the cover so everybody... Oh, uh, yes. The Bluffs. The Bluffs. And you've got... Yep, you've got it there. Somewhere. Yep, yep, yep. I've got it here in my stack of... My bag of tricks. Yep, there we are. I think I've got... Uh, yeah, I tend to have the advanced copies. I never get them. So I've probably, there's probably a typo somewhere in mine, but I kind of think of those as extra special, actually. That's exactly right. It's like a leather jacket. It's That's the, right, the perfections yeah. make it authentic. That's right. Mine will be more valuable than everybody else's. Um, so, and I think what was extraordinary is this book came out and there are Tasmanian crime writers and it was just boom. It was incredibly successful. Mm. Um, and was that a shock? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'll just start by uh, just saying that I am dialing in this morning, uh, the, tonight from Tommy Guinea country, um, northwest Tasmania, and pay my respects to elders past and present as well. Yeah, so when the bluffs came onto the scene, we knew that there would be, we knew that the publishers were excited about it. Um, my agent and I knew that that um, Penguin were really excited. They were the great, the, they were the perfect home for the bluffs. And so that makes a difference for books that you, you want um, the people on your publishing team to really be passionate about it. But none of us expected it to have the overwhelming success that the bluffs has had. I mean, just, just last week found out that um, the bluffs was, was nominated for the best debut fiction with the Ned Kellys which brings up the book of the year nominations to five. That's five separate nominations. The bluffs has received now for book of the year. Which is a pretty good start. I, it's, 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 it doesn't feel real, Catherine. <laughs> like yeah. I can say this with, I can say this and just in the back of my head, think, man, like someone pinched me. This doesn't, it's the fairy tale beginning. And I've had the fairy tale beginning aside from COVID, which, you know, affects the, the dream is to have a, have a tour. The dream is to get to meet readers. The dream is to get to see your, your book in, in bookshelves across the mm. country. But aside from that, I wouldn't change anything. But of course, when you do get to meet readers, and you will, um, they'll, they'll know you already. Like, they'll know you and love you already. It will yeah. be kind of like, oh, Kyle, you know. They'll feel that they know who you are. Because your second book, which has just come out, is The Deep. Yes, The Deep. And, um, and so far pretty damn good response already so we'll look for the for the books of the year nominations and, <laughs> and you know we'll look at that but let's um let's have a chat about it and I mean yep. I'm like, like I'm sitting here thinking okay so next year this time there'll be another book but that might be a, I might be being a bit demanding there <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about about the deep 
But first, I think I'd like to talk about Tasmania. We talked a bit about this as we were getting to know each other. And to me, it seems to have two faces. So I was, I've been living in Australia for about 30 years, a bit less. So I knew nothing about Tasmania except that it was there. Um, but it seems to have these... Well, I knew nothing about Australia very much, except that it was there. But um, you marry an Australian, there you are. Um, so, like, it's got two faces. There's the Apple Isle, I think people used to call it, this beautiful, extraordinary natural beauty. Mm. Um, and, of course, I'd heard of the various attempts to dam the Franklin River and other things. Mm. Um, uh, so I'd heard about that. So there's this this slightly beautiful place. And then there's... a. There's a dark side. There's Tasmanian Gothic. There's mm. appalling mistreatment of the indigenous people. There's mm. appalling mistreatment of convicts mm. um, at the same time. And the crime level set there in the past few years, really, as far as I can see, have accentuated that. I mean, there's, um, who is there? Well, Sarah, I mean, Jane Harper set the survivors there, and that was kind of bleak, and, and, a, and a water side the um setting as well ljmo in the great divide is very bleak got that so yeah I've got train half a right oh, the survivors yes yeah absolutely um poppy g i think that's you pronounce her name yes. um, sarah barry who isn't based there but has written very dark mysterious books what's that about <laughs> well i think part of it is what you said there like the way that the tasmanian aboriginals were treated um absolutely devastating and it was it's the first kind of recorded case of genocide in human history um and there's this blood in the soil down here i mean we had you know australia uh, tasmania had australia's biggest massacre you know down at um port arthur the port, um, port arthur itself there's sarah's island which is you know was uh, when you went to Sarah's Island as a convict, you passed through what was called Hell's Gates because you knew you were going to hell. It was where they introduced solitary confinement. It's where they introduced psychological um, torture of inmates. So the history of Tasmania, even though it's extraordinarily recent, you know, in the terms of, of the world stage, mm. it's just rife with pretty bad stuff. Um, and then how that translates into the culture today i mean i'm descended from convicts on both sides you know so you know there's this generational stuff that passes down when you've got massive displacement we we lack that connection to probably the spiritual side of the country just because of the way the tasmanian aboriginals were treated and all the you know the the culture that was lost and I, something though that comes into the the Tasmanian Gothic feel. And it's interesting talking about this now because I, a local high school reached out to me the other day just to say, oh, we're studying your text in, um, we're studying the bluffs in our literacy um, class. And I was a youth worker, um, you know, when I wrote the bluffs and my initial thought was like, oh, this is not the right book to be studying in high school. <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend it. But they said, well, we're looking at this from the, from the, the uh, topic of, of Gothic and Tasmania Gothic. Mm. And so I had been using the word Tasmania Gothic. I'd been using the word Gothic a little bit, but didn't fully understand it. But they sent me through the learning resources they used for my book, which was amazing. That's one of the coolest experiences <laughs> I've had. Um, and the description there about how Gothic is about um, isolation mm -hmm. um, and Tasmania is, just fits that to a T like to get to Tasmania you know, you've got to cross an ocean, no matter where you come from. And the Bass Strait is treacherous. You know, mm. they're all, we're so close to Antarctica, the rest of the ocean's treacherous. There's bushland down here that, as far as we know, no one's ever set foot in. 40% of the whole island is protected national park or protected forest. Like, it's just that, I mean, all of that stuff just comes in together, Catherine, to create the perfect intrigue, the perfect mystery, the perfect kind of energy to set a story in. Yeah, and to reflect, to, for nature is kind of working with you if you're writing crime or that sort of gothic, for the want of better mm. um, stuff. So now I've described The Deep as your second book, but in fact, I read that you've written more, a lot more than two <laughs> books. So I should have said second published book. So tell us about this. Did you always love writing? What was your journey to publication? I always wanted to be a writer from the moment I can remember. And so I'm dialing in today from tonight from my childhood bedroom. 
<laughs> and so right here, this desk used to be my bed. And right here against this wall is where my pillow used to lay. And I remember here, my back against the wall, pillow behind the small of my back reading. And that was my favorite thing to do. Reading was like uh, to the point where it surprised me that it wasn't everyone else's favorite hobby. You know, when you're a kid and you're really egocentric mm. and I thought that everyone must have loved reading as much as me. And what did you uh, read? Well, I remember like fantasy, like magic faraway tree. Um, I really loved Artemis Fowl. I loved Emily Rodder, all of Emily Rodder's books. Um, I just was a really voracious reader. I'd go to the library, go through the kids section, almost just kind of go chronologically down each section, take it home, read them, take them back. Um, Tamara Pierce uh, was a massive love of mine. And it's probably in grade six, I sent Tamara Pierce an email and she writes fantasy, like the teenage fantasy books. And I sent her an email in grade six saying, I love your books and um, I want to be a writer like you one day. And she replied and she basically said, look, I think you've got what it takes. And uh, from that moment, I can quantify, if I was to quantify it, that's the moment where I decided that you this did. is what I want to do. And when did you start? Did you start? Did you write a lot while you were at school or did you write later? Or So I wrote, I loved the short story writing, loved it. That was my favorite thing to do every class. Um, I wasn't very good at it, to be honest. I know my friends were better, but I loved it. I loved it. And then in grade eight, when I, when I moved to high school, I wrote this piece about, um, it was like the history of Australia. And my teacher, she kind of made a point of commenting, this is amazing work, Kyle. You know, you should be a journalist. You're a really good writer. And then, um, so I was writing that. And then we, uh, in grade nine, um, in my literacy uh, extended class, I wrote kind of a bit of a, a collection of short stories. And that was when I really got a taste for, okay, this is fun. And I'm going to spend my, my spare time doing this, not just my school time. And you carried on. So, but you, you developed a different career, not writing based. So, yeah. So, so what I, my plan had been to go to Hobart and study journalism uh, because I thought that's how you become a writer. I had some pretty significant health barriers in grade 12, my last year of um, down here, we call it college. 11 and 12 was called college in Tasmania. My last year of college, um, I had some health problems that made it a bit impossible for me to move that far away from my family. So I changed trajectory and I started, started studying psychology, which um, was something I'd always been interested in. I'm very much an extrovert. I really enjoy people's stories, people's journeys. Started studying psychology, but because of these health barriers, um, I didn't finish that first year. Um, then I stepped away and, you know, went to some other stuff. But during this time, from age 16, I was writing, like in my spare time. Even through all my barriers, through my challenges, I was still writing. And I was able to average a book a year. So I wrote a manuscript a year from age 16 to age 26. In the um, prime genre or what kind of? And that was all in what I was reading at the time, which was young adult fantasy. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm a great lover of, actually, I love young adult books. They're my, part of my, so I just was reading one last night. I, I don't understand why everybody doesn't love it because it's so, there's so much transformation. But anyway, mm. that's another, another subject altogether. No, no, it's an important subject because what, what the only thing that makes a young adult book, a young adult book is the fact the protagonist is a young adult. Like aside from that, everything else there, the themes, the transformation, the battles, it's all just as relevant to us. It's not like once you, you grow up, you stop having these things, you know, in your life. And because I'd spent 10 years writing Young Adult, um, the bluffs, part of the reason people love the bluffs is because it's got those young adult Yeah, it's full stories. of young adults. Yeah, yeah it's full yeah. of young adults. The, the prose is real pacey. The dialogue is accessible. You'll struggle to find a word in there that you need to go away and look up in the dictionary because, like, I made it as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. It's just that I made the themes so dark and kind of not teenage friendly that it's, a, that it's an adult book. Not teenage friendly, but teenage related in many ways. I mean, that, that, the, many of the people in that book are teenagers. 
Well, I guess when I say it's not teenage friendly, I'm speaking from with my youth worker hat on. Yeah. So those who have read the bluffs know that there's lots of mentions of suicide, of self-harm, of abuse, bullying, and the use of social media in a dark way. And so as a, as a counsellor and, as, and as, a, as a youth worker, I am very quick to say, don't please don't. Please don't give this unsupervised to young adults because there's themes in here that need to be discussed. But might make it very good for school, as you said. You've got those kids looking at it at school. It would be they'd recognise a lot of it. Well, yeah. Well, it's been it happened. So everything that happened in the bluffs, basically everything is, was inspired by true events. Um, it was inspired by things that I'd encountered in my work as a youth worker in my job as, um, as a counsellor in, in, a, in a rehab. It was all real stuff. Mm. But, um, but it's extraordinarily, it can be very triggering and it can be very just, it's a lot to navigate if you don't have someone to help you navigate it. Yeah. And that's so why, yeah. well, well, I mean, the school was just um, studying it from the Tasmanian Gothic. So I guess they, they probably um, not giving the whole thing to them. But one of my other friends, who's also a high school teacher down here, he tried calling me um, one night because he was at school camp and he's like, all my students are talking about your book. They've all read your book. <laughs> and he's like, I wanted to let them know I knew you. And the, and the youth worker in me is like, who's giving my book to these kids? Like, I'm, I'm concerned about this. But anyway, I'm probably a little bit overzealous. I feel a lot of obligation just, you know, I just yeah. want, I want to make sure people are okay. People are, Yeah. But I've, maybe there's an argument to say that you're more okay if you recognise something than if it's denied. And if you end up thinking you're making it up, like it's only you, if you encounter it in literature, then it's real. Yeah, no, that's good. I like, yeah, I like that, Catherine. It's sort of like, yeah, if it's, um, you're not alone in it, I guess, if you recognise yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, even though it may not. But I, I take the point we have to be, you have to be careful as well. So if we look at the deep now. Yes. That's move, what we do. So the Bluffs was very much an inland, mountainous, forested. Yeah. I mean, although it does end at the sea, I think, at the beach, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? But it's very much inland. This is very much about the coast, almost yeah. entirely. And a lot of coastal cultures who rely on the ocean for their living have stories or myths or legends around the sea and the creatures who live in the sea and the dangers of the sea. And in this book, there are two really, the black wind and the sirens or mermaids, depending on which side you're looking at. Um, could you read the, the, the epigraphs, the beginning of the book? Because they really set, set yeah. a lot of the scene for the book the darkness and the, the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll read. Um, all three of them, the back wind and then the. Yeah, okay, I'll read all three. So I'm reading from the start of my book. There's, um, these are the three, there's three pages, three, what do you call them? Epigraphs. That's Epigraphs? what they're called. Know, That's probably the right word. I don't know. I never know Epi what to call them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, so the first one is black wind at morning, sailors take warning. Black wind at night, death is in sight. Maritime saying of the Tasman Peninsula. The next page. The sirens of the Tasman Peninsula are known to be evil creatures who lure sailors to their deaths. Their songs were reported to be haunting and beautiful, sweeping many people into the deep. This is from Folk Tales of Tasmania by Cheryl Sterling. And the final. When first I heard the siren's song, twas out upon the sea. Their gaze was hot, their hunger high, a coward I did flee. Terror I flew to my domain, but she did follow me. Far from, far from that misty bounding main, the black wind of the sea. Now ever I must flee, there is no peace for me. Dr. William Ashbury, circa, 19, uh, circa 1850s. So this one has both the sirens and the black wind. So the black wind is, is literally a, a, a saying, it's a bit like, Red sky at night, shepherd's delight, but much more to do with the ocean. Um, it's <laughs> what's gonna. Yeah, okay. well, um, no, all three of those, they're they're not real. They're made up for the story. So. Okay, okay. but they have an echo in. Um, but where they were in, but inspired by. When you go to the Eaglehawk Neck, when you're down there by the coast, there the wind 
does funny things. So when I went to Eaglehawk Neck, um, there was the wind droned. I could hear it underneath. I could hear it. It had a weird, had a weird, it's a weird, weird effect on me. And we know that the coasts, the coastal waters of Tasmania are treacherous. And we know that there's some really interesting geology. Um, and I mean, you read about this shipwrecks, you know, off that shore everywhere. So what I was doing was similar to what I did in the bluffs where I crafted this, um, this legend of the hungry man, which was inspired by, you know, potentially real things that have happened in the Tasmanian bush. And so in that same way, when I set out to craft the mythology of the deep, um, these were the, the three I landed on. But um, I've had even my dad, <laughs> my, my dad sat me down and he's like, oh, man, like, where can I find more of this guy's poems? And, I, and I'm <laughs> like, dad, I, it's, dad. <laughs> I said, dad, it's not real. And he said, yes, it is. It has to be. And I said, no, nah. no, I said, the black wind isn't a real thing. And he said, no, nah, I think it is. So anyway, so the jury's out. Maybe it is real. Maybe it's not. But Certainly treacherous winds that come up and overwhelm are not mythical at all. And, no. and I mean, sirens have existed since Odysseus had to lash himself to the mast so that he could look at the sirens but he wouldn't hear their yeah he couldn't yeah. answer them so these are very very long existing and very powerful human human myths and, and human fears mm. um, now there's another myth or is it are these all I mean you give these a mythical dimension and I think that's a really interesting thing in your book because it was the same with the bluffs there's a mythical dimension and at any one time, we're not actually sure if this is real or if it isn't. Or And playing on that is really extraordinary, actually, because life is not full of certainty. Life is actually full of uncertainty. Absolutely. It's, um, so that's really interesting. But the, um, the fourth myth is the dread pirate Blackbeard, um, who is a, yes, a legend, um, more obviously a legend. Yeah. Um, but you describe him as a, a mon that moniker taken from dread pirate Roberts, the infamous man who had captained the Silk Road, the first black market on the dark web. His mm. name in turn would be taken from the Princess Bride, which featured the original dread pirate Roberts, a feared pirate whose name was passed down to his successor. So he could continue to reign with terror even after his death. But this dread pirate Blackbeard was the same. No one knew who he was, or where he'd come from, but he'd ruthlessly, ruthlessly taken over other operations all around Indonesia and Southeast Asia and even New Zealand. He ran business in every illegal trade, drugs, weapons, human imports, body disposal. He'd been wanting to find a way into Australia for years. And of course, the rumours said his sights were on Tasmania as a way in. So that's kind of in the background of the story and it comes to the foreground eventually. So it's a really important, and again, this kind of lurk and everybody is frightened of him. Yeah. He's, he's this, nobody quite knows, but um, so I'd like to give a, a feeling, more of a feeling now what the book's about. I mean, no spoilers, cause that makes it very annoying, hate spoilers. <laughs> Friend of mine refuses to speak to me. She said, don't, stop. <laughs> I, well, don't. I just once gave her a spoiler and it wasn't even a bad spoiler. Anyway, yeah. we know the setting. It's the setting's a small town on the Tasman Peninsula. The main source of employment, apart from some tourism, um, is the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. um, abalone fishing. But you tell us this from the beginning, so I don't think this is a spoiler. There is genuine abalone fishing, but it's also run as a drug cover for a drug, major drug ring yeah. by um, a family you call the Dempsey family. Now, introduce us to the family. There's Ivy. Yes. So the Dempsey family, they run the, uh, they run the, the local criminal enterprise there on the coast. They have a very successful drug importing business under the cover of abalone diving. So abalone is a very interesting process because it requires divers down um, on the seabed uh, and they find the, the fish or technically they're sea snails. They find the abalone, they put them in their catch bags um, and they shoot the, the catch bags back up to the boat to you know put in the boat and take back to shore. So it's the perfect place to get 
precursor chemicals or to get other things in from the ocean, from other sources. So you could have a boat from China come down, go out to the, the continental shelf, drop some stuff down on, on the uh, ocean floor, send off, you know, take off, and then you guys come along, swim down, pick it up, take it back in. It's also a really good way, again, for things like body disposal. So in the underworld, one of the uh, most difficult barriers is what to do with someone's body once they've been taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so the continental shelf is a very good place to get rid of that evidence. Mm -hmm. So the Dempsey family has a finger in both these pies as well as a few others. It's pretty normal in criminal families and criminal enterprises to do a lot of different things. In the book, we've got the Dempseys. So the, the story is mainly about Mac, Mac, Mackerel Dempsey. Um, his real name's Mackenzie, but everyone calls him Mackerel. He's the youngest son. He's a bit of an outcast. He's, um, he just did a stint in prison. So now he's on really strict bail conditions, which means he has to uh, sign in every morning at the police station. He has to be home by curfew. Can't even have his own pain meds. He's got to go to the chemist every day to get his dose because he's not allowed to have it with him. Mm -hmm. We've got, um, he's the youngest. His elder brother, Davey, um, is the one now running the business. He's quite good looking. He's successful. He's rich. All of the town loves him. Most of the town don't realize that he is running a criminal enterprise. Even his wife doesn't know he's running a criminal enterprise. That's because abalone as a business is so lucrative anyway. It's, it's easy right. to, um, it's a million dollar, multi-million dollar business. So that's so, how they managed to cover yeah. abalone is a lucrative business in its own right. Yeah. Yeah. The issue is that, you know, abalone is dying out, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to, to make a living out of it. Uh, I mean, at least in, compared to what it is. And then, so we've got Makarua, we've got Davey, and then we've got their mother, Ivy, and she's the matriarch of the family. So she keeps everything running. She and her, um, and her husband uh, passed away, Joel. He and her uh, have been kind of getting things going. He passed away. And then also, I guess, the other part of the story. I mean, this all sounds very complicated. Uh, it makes more sense as you read it. But another member of the family is the eldest son. So Mackerel and Davy's brother, Jesse, mm -hmm. the eldest son who he, his wife and his son have been missing for seven years. So originally they were running the business. He was a bit of a sociopath, a bit of a psychopath, very brutal, very violent man, mm -hmm. held the business with an iron thumb. And then now he's uh, he's been he's missing appeared. for seven years. Yeah. And the book opens with the reappearance. And again, this is not a spoiler of their son who's been missing for seven years, who washes up on the shore. This young, young man. I can't remember exactly how old he is. 13. 13. Yeah. Maybe, just so like on the cusp of, of adolescence. Mm. And what's he got written on his back? This is quite scary. So when he so so Forrest Dempsey, um, Jesse's son, missing for seven years. Again, it's not a spoiler because you're right, it's in the prologue. He washes up on the shore and on the back it says, this is, on, the, on his back it's been tattooed into his shoulder blade, the words, this is Forrest Dempsey, be careful what you wish for. Pretty, uh, pretty tough, tough stuff. And the, why is he so important? So he's important because, first of all, he's the heir to the business. So family dynasties and even the abalone business itself you know, how it's set up, it all falls to him. So the even... The eldest son of the eldest son, or the yeah. only son of the eldest yeah. son. So because he's alive now, um, Jesse's all Jesse's share goes to him. Jesse's got the main share, which means even if he wasn't involved in the drug business, even if they kept him away from the drug business, him being around affects the abalone business, which in turn is the cover for the drug business. So that's why things are really... The straight away there's complications the other complication is the fact that if he's alive what the heck has happened to him what's happened to his his mum and dad yeah. and what does this mean for the business now and then the third complication that's added in is that because Forrest has reappeared this creates a lot of uncertainty for the business which means that rival drug kingpins rival um, criminal leaders who are always looking to build on their territory in this case, the dread pirate Blackbeard, they recognise, all right, the Dempsey criminal dynasty is now vulnerable. It's time to move in and, and try and take over. 
There's one other, I mean, there are other characters. There's one other really important Dempsey, except he's not exactly a Dempsey. Yeah, so the other, so the book's written from three point of view characters. We've got Mac Dempsey, Forrest Dempsey, and then we also have Ahab Stark. So Ahab's mother was a Dempsey, so he's of Dempsey blood, but his father was a Stark. And Ahab, yeah, he's part of the Dempsey family, but he has removed himself from the business um, because his mother was tragically taken by her own um, ice dependence. So she became dependent on ice. Um, this ruined her life um, and resulted in her, um, her passing away. And so Ahab then renounced the family, renounced the business and is trying desperately. Well, not, I mean, he's quite successfully yeah. on the straight and narrow and he runs the local, uh, the local inn, the bar, the pub, the inn, it's called the mermaid's darling. And he just uh, stays clear away from the Dempseys, including Ivy, whom has a fierce hatred for him. But of course, with Forrest's reappearance, things become much more complicated. And basically, you know, chaos ensues. The police become interested because they go, hey, where's he been? What's going on? Um, and they're only too aware that Ivy is up to something. I don't know that they know from the beginning the whole story, but they know there is something distinctly dodgy. I was going to mm. say 50, that's not a really good analogy. Um, a lot of the book, I mean, we, we don't, I don't want to talk too much about that because it's, it's you unpack it slowly and kind of agonizingly, really. Something happens and something else happens and you think, oh, I've got it. And then it's not quite right. But a lot of the book and really the, in a way, the, the, hot, the basis of the story behind the scenes is, is the Dempsey family, is the relationship between the members of the family, the violence, the cruelty, the favoritism of shown to one child against another child and the massive emotional damage done to them. Why are you so interested in family? What I'm interested in is the way that Primarily, I was interested in, in exploring um, substance dependence. So I was, I was interested in exploring the way that people who use drugs are affected by whatever the substance is that they have a dependence on. Mm. With that comes very interesting social and family dynamics. What we find is that a lot of families will help, they'll help, they'll help, and then they'll just stop helping. They'll give up. Um, this is then further exacerbated when there's a criminal element. So I was very interested in exploring the depths of family when it comes to lucrative multi-million dollar businesses, the depths of family when it comes to keeping secrets that keep others out of prison. I was very interested in, in there's this, uh, th there's something that happens to people who use ice where if you have a prolonged use of ice, um, you stop being able to sleep, you get very sleep deprived. And with sleep deprivation comes a form of psychosis. So essentially, you know, in today's terms, you'd say you, they lose their mind. What I was interested in is in my job, in, in, I was a counselor and a case manager in a drug and alcohol rehab the whole time I wrote this book. And I was very interested in how quickly people would turn on their family if their family lapsed into this drug induced psychosis. So the moment someone, you know, if someone was had a dependence on a substance, their family would support them. No worries. But the moment they lost their mind and started seeing things and, you know, started trying to dig bugs out of their skin, the family just kind of went, I do not know how to deal with this. You know, I wash my hands of you. And I, I saw that time and time again in my characters, I mean, in my um, clients. And so I wanted to explore that in my characters too. And does that happen regardless of whether those people themselves were using drugs, the family members who ignore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, I mean, it's it, uh, everything's fairly... Everything. I mean, everything's complicated. Everything's case by case. But, yeah, it definitely... Family members, even family members who are partaking in the same substance use are very quick to, it's almost like the moment a soldier's down, you shoot them to put them out of their misery. And, you know, the moment someone loses their mind, all right, they're not coming back. 
let's just um, cut them off now because we're going to have to do it eventually anyway. And they're going to be unreliable. They might give things away, I suppose. Well, what's interesting is that some criminal organisations will drug test their members because they're aware that if this person's using ice, that they're going to become an unreliable member. So there's, there's quite a lot of, you know, bikey clubs um, and they're not the only criminal organisations out there, but, you know, some of them do have criminal dealings. And you'll find the people engaged in those dealings, often the leaders will insist on what we call UTs, urine tests. They'll say, hey, look, you know, we're going to catch up this week. Also, we're going to, do, we're going to UT you to make sure you haven't been on the ice this week because if you've been on the ice, then, sorry, buddy, you're out of the crew. Gosh, that's, um, that's interesting. Because so, I was going to say there are drugs and drug using people and drug dealing people in both your books actually yeah um, i yeah. mean it's very strong in this book but it, it's there in in the in um, the bluffs so are drugs a particularly big issue in tasmania i know you said you've worked in the field so obviously you know about it but is it a, a major issue in tasmania i think it's yeah yeah um y- yes it is What's a bigger issue is um, resources to help. Mm. So actual, actual. Um, I mean, there's, I don't know. There's, there's only so much I can say because I work for the peak body, and I've got to, got to, yeah. you know, be careful of of, of what, what I say. But that there is a lot of barriers to people seeking help. Yeah. Um, but in Tassie, it's definitely. The, the if we're going to go into like specifics heroin use and opiate use down here isn't a, isn't that big to be honest you you won't find that much heroin use on the streets of Hobart you'll find it you'll find it anywhere but it's not as big of a deal as you might find it in in Queensland or New South Wales but ice is pretty massive down here um, it's it's easy to access it's cheap it's dirty like like it's um what I mean by dirty is I mean it's like cut with pretty dirty chemicals it's not not pure and um there's just uh, a certain yeah, there's a there's a quite a large drug using uh, percentage of the the tasmanian populace but that being said there's there's a large popul there's a large percentage of every populace um and in tasmania it just seems to be a bit more amplified because we've got a small population mm-hmm. we're stuck on an island yeah. And there's just not enough resources. Like if you want to get into detox down here, mm. so in order, like if you, for example, for, <laughs> now, let me just put on my counselling hat for a sec. If you have a dependence on alcohol and you have been really using a lot of alcohol, now you want to come off alcohol, you want to stop using it. If you've been using it for a certain amount of time at a certain level, you literally cannot stop, otherwise you will die. Your body will shut down. Mm. The only way to do it is a medically supervised detox. However, the amount of beds available for a medically detox, um, me- medic- medic- medically um, detox is, is they're, they're fairly small. So it's just this barrier constant. It's like, hey, I want to get help, but I've got to wait at least three weeks minimum. You know, the window's gone. So mm-hmm. it's just the, the actual health, um, the health landscape affects the use of substance. I mean, ice is almost a character in this book in its own right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I'm not, I don't think this is that much of a spoiler to, to say that the sirens and their song, you know, drawing sailors to the deep is definitely a metaphor for the siren song of ice, the siren song of, of substance um, dragging people into the deep as well. And with the bluffs, we talk a lot about cannabis, um, which... Mm-hmm is extremely minor compared to ice, whereas in, um, in the deep, we go very deep into um, the ice epidemic and, and its effect on people and its continuing effect on people. And, and the, you describe in the book, I mean, almost incidentally, and that makes it all the more horrifying, some truly appalling things that people do, particularly yeah. to their children. I must say, I, without saying any more about that, I was just, the, the cruelty seemed extraordinary. But presumably if you mix ice with mental illness, that's like a really bad combo. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and, and generational trauma is a thing. Um, the way that people are treated is, you know, unless they're taught differently, they think that's normal to treat their children that way. Mental illness comes into it. Drug-induced psychosis comes into it. And then there's also just, um, yeah, plain, you know, there's people who don't care about hurting other people. And if you get on a substance that exacerbates your feelings, then you're going to care even less about hurting people. But I mean, this sounds very bleak and very grim. And the book is actually not bleak and grim entirely at all, uh, without, again, giving anything away. And Mac, Mackerel is a really important character in this way. Tell us a bit about him. And also, I gather you based him on, on people. You, you got a lot of your information from specific a specific person. Is that right? Yeah, so I, a lot of the characters in there, I drew information and and insight from from different, not only clients, but colleagues and friends of clients or friends of colleagues. The character of Mac is based on one guy in particular who mm. was a friend of a friend I met who had all the same bowel conditions. So this guy had a daily sign-in. He had a curfew. Um, he had to go to the chemist every morning to get his pain medication. Um, it wasn't doing enough for him, but he, he needed a stronger dose. But the process of getting a stronger dose for someone with that um, criminal history is just too much effort. Um, and he was interesting because he had had it all. Uh, he had been, he'd spent a whole year living in penthouse suites of hotels, um, you know, really successful drug dealer. And so when I was talked to him, I was actually sitting in this seat right here. Um, I was visiting my parents that week. I was on the phone to him, typing at this laptop, all the stuff he was telling me. And then inside of that, I thought, you are the perfect um, character to base Mac on. And so Mac in the story, you know, it's about his journey of going, you know, the, the outcast, the one who couldn't do it, to trying to be a good man. He, part of his whole story is he just wants to be a good person. He wants to rehabilitate. And I was interested particularly in, in exploring the barriers to that for someone with those conditions. Like if you've got daily sign-in and curfew conditions, it's pretty difficult to find a job. Like it, it can be difficult to find a job. And for Mac, he, what he's good at is diving. But in Tasmania, all Tasmanian fishermen, diving fishermen have to be um, of good character they've got to have the kind of police check so even that was taken away from him so so I was interested in exploring that but what what I try to do in both the bluffs and the deep is that I always even though I'm, I'm talking about bleak topics I always want it to end with a happy ending I want it to end hopeful I want my characters to go on this really encouraging um, uplifting you know I want them to grow and I want the reader to feel like they've grown with them we see that with Ma with Mackerel in particular, but not in a fairy tale kind of a way. Because one of the things you describe is, is for him the lure of being a drug dealer. Mm. Yeah. The power, but especially given his background and being belittled by his family, I don't think that's given away too much. Mm. Um, it makes him feel good. It makes him feel important, and that. Mm. You know, it may not be the right thing to feel important by doing, but it's still there. Yeah, absolutely. And Catherine, that's one of the biggest barriers is we've got people who use drugs or people who deal drugs. And then suddenly, you know, when you're, you're out there, you've got all the money, you've got all the respect. Everyone wants to know you. You've got three phones. You've got people who, I mean, a lot of it's false respect. A lot of it's just based on what you can get. Mm. But there's a big part of that. There's a community, you know, people who use drugs together. There's a connection that they build rightly or wrongly we can't deny that and then all of a sudden we say look that's bad that's wrong you've got bad moral character now rehabilitate and make new friends by the way everyone's going to look down on you by the way no one's going to understand your trauma by the way no one's got really any time to listen to what you're going through and so you weigh them side by side you've got i'm a drug dealer with lots of money lots of respect all the fancy clothes all the gold chains versus i literally can't even hold down a job now and people you know cross the street to avoid me mm. and then we, we put people in that position who've already been through trauma have already been through difficult times and we say hey look choose this one like it's just i'm interested in exploring that and mm. i'm in and i enjoyed the fact that mac found himself in that and that you know he the reader can recognize just how difficult it is for someone who's had it all to give it all up and it's not easy for him so it's not as i said it really isn't fairy tale i mean he struggles and he 
lapses as well. Yeah. But moves forward. I'm just looking at some of the questions, and one of them is is kind of moving on from this, from your work as a as a drug and alcohol counselor at that time. Do do you have to separate your writing life from that life, or is it? Do you bring them together and create something new? I bring them together. Um, I mean, writing for me, it's not a job. It's it's my hobby. It's my favorite thing to do. It's my you know my one love, my true love. So I'm always in the writing mood. I'm always like stories when they come to me. I'm always like, oh, I want to like write about that, nonfiction mm. or fiction. When it comes to to putting something into the form of a book and, and sending it out there, even though I have no agenda, I'm actually just, I just want to tell a good story. I want I want something that's going to take people away. There's also an obligation there to for my readers. My readers want an experience that's true, that rings true. Yeah. And my clients want the world to understand the barriers and the the things that they go through. So there's this. It's a perfect marriage for me. My counselling and my writing that they go well together. The only time when it becomes difficult is the fact that they both demand quite a lot of my emotional energy. Mm. Writing, writing's quite the focus, the typing, the energy. It's quite, it's quite tiring and counseling. You know, I hear a torture story every Tuesday. Like I might, I'm, I'm always struggling to, to navigate other people's emotional crises and that, takes a toll so in that way the only time they don't are compatible is when they both demand too much from me and how do you how do you juggle them i mean do you how how do you when do you write so practically i juggle them by only working three days a week in my day job only Mm -hmm. um which i mean is only there's only a proportion of that that's successful because it doesn't mean you stop thinking about these people on the days you don't work but practically the the, what i've got in place is i work three days a week and then i write for the rest of the week Mm. um i also i've got a lot of support i've got a lot of like i've got clinical supervision which means every month i have to see a counselor it's part of my contract i have to see someone um which is great i love it and she's great um i've got a lot of other friends and family that support me with my writing, I've got this amazing community of readers. Um, I've got, I get tagged in these awesome reviews um, on Instagram. I get great messages. I get lots of discussion. My team at Penguin, you know, my, my publisher, Ali Watts, she's amazing. You know, she's like my fairy godmother. She takes care of me. So I've just really lucky in that I've got a lot of good people around me that support me to write in the face of this but yeah practically speaking i've got days set aside for writing right for for actually for writing and how how long does the first draft take it's a typical first draft the first draft for the bluffs took three months gosh three months yeah (laughs) um first draft for the deep i don't know i was writing that whilst i was also editing the bluffs so it's hard to quantify that but i imagine it's probably a bit quicker uh, probably about the same but the, the first draft, you know, that changes a lot. In the first draft of The Deep, this is interesting, one of the main characters in The Deep is Shelby Dempsey, who is the, the wife of Davy Dempsey. Mm-hmm. Um, in the first draft of The Deep, the story was all about her. She mm-hmm. was the main point of view character. Yeah, Mac was more, it was Mac and Shelby, their, their story side by side. But, um, yeah, it was mainly about her. Gosh, well, that's yeah. I mean, she still appears and she's still important, but in a very, in a very different way. And again, something I meant to ask earlier is, and somebody else has asked, how did you get from that spec, well, you know, fantasy fiction, writing that to writing, well, crime fiction broadly? What? what so that the, the uh, other I, area. I mean, that's a there's, that's a long that's a long story, but to make it short. I, um, the lady who became my agent, Hayley Nash, Hayley Karens now, she, um, I had reached out to her to edit one of my young adult novels or just to offer freelance advice because she did, um, she offered that service at the time. And uh, I explained my story. I said, this is my 10th book. Um, And at that stage, I'd got really, really close with a New York City agent with this 10th book, with this young adult book. Mm. Um, And I'm like, Hayley, I'm so close. Um, Can I pay you just to fix it, please? Because I was working, I'd I'd finished my counselling degree and I was working at the time. I finally had some money. And then her response was kind of very insightful. She said, you've been writing this for 10 years. 
you know, have you thought about trying a different genre? Have you thought about trying something else? You've written, <laughs> and um, and initially I was very opposed to that. I'm like, no way. I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm going to do this for another 10 years till I yeah. make it. Yeah. But um, I thought about it and I ended up hiring her for a phone call and I just said, all right, coach me through my blind spots. Help me see, you know, creatively, maybe I'm burnt out now from young adult, you know, what's something else I should mm. have a go at. And then she's the one who said, well, what have you read that you've enjoyed? And I said, The Dry by Jane Harper. And she said, you know, what's your day job? And I said, well, I work in a school with disengaged youth. Um, and with that, you know, was a lot of criminal activity. And I live in a country town. So the idea of I enjoyed crime. I love crime books. Um, I was working kind of around criminal activity and I had a mental health um, qualification background, lived in the country. It all kind of came together. And she said, well, why don't you try your hand at writing crime novel? And I said, no, I can't write for adults. Like I can only write for kids. <laughs> but I gave it a shot. And here we are. And you live to tell the tale. And we, <laughs> we live to read the tale, which I think is, is really good for us. In fact, somebody is somebody who is from Camaragal land in Chatswood, um, is a teacher librarian, and she would really like to know about those learning resources for the bluffs. Okay. <laughs> it was then, so, yeah. um, you know, can you, if the school in Tassie approves, can you share them or maybe, maybe go back to Christine and see what you can, um, what you can find out? Um, so you read, do you read a lot of crime? Do you read while you're writing? I struggle to read crime books while I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, I find I read a lot, but I'll, if I have to read um, while I'm writing, I'll read like a young adult book a fantasy book or I'll reread something I've read before unless it's like a really exciting book or um, you know someone sent me an advanced copy to read sometimes I'll get through it for example recently um, I was sent the new Don Wins Winslow book um, City on Fire mm -hmm. and I, I sat down and I thought oh I'm going to struggle to read this because it's all it's all about like um, gang warfare and I'm dealing with that in my day job I'm like oh this is going to be hard to read but I, I read it in two sittings, which for me is very significant. So I enjoyed that um, when I'm not writing or like when I've sent off the manuscript and I'm waiting for it to come back, then I, yeah, I'll read all the Australian crime I can find, all the Australian writers. I love, um, I love Aussie writing and I especially love just the fact that I get to participate in that community now. Um, so it feels like a community? Yeah. Look, book, book culture is amazing. In Australia, um, book and bookshops and libraries, they're like the cultural hubs, you know. And I mean, I'm including online, you know, like Booktopia and well, as well in that. There's these cultural hubs where people kind of meet around, they coalesce, things like this, you know, they're, they're like watering holes of the ancient world. So we meet in places like this and we can talk about um, books, which what, what people, I think people get this is that books. They're, they're this amazing blend of art, science and philosophy, like all in one. And they're so great to talk about. And in Australia, there's this amazing community of, of people who run festivals, Catherine, people who, who um, are invi invite you on to a discussion, who, who want to talk about the process. And for writers and book people, you know, we love this. The reason we do this is because we love books and it's so great to be part of an Australian community. In the back of the deep, I thank, um, in my acknowledgements, I thank four pretty major figures in Australian writing. Um, Trent Dalton, Chris Hammer, Jane Harper, Craig Sylvie, because I reached out to them with my second book syndrome and I said, look, I am struggling. Give me some advice. And they all helped. They all responded. I they gave me their time. my copy because I had this advanced copy. See, there's oh, yeah. always disadvantages. That's beautifully generous people. Yeah, yeah, and like, and and I mean, there's a bit of imposter syndrome for myself where I think there's no way, you know, Jane Harper's not going to reply to me. And then I turn around and she's at one of my online events, and then she's replying to my my question and asking me questions. And I'm like, is this? You're the reason I'm right. I wrote this book, Jane. You know, like it's just. <laughs> It's surreal and it's awesome and I love it. And this is, you know, this is the best job in the world. So you're going to be, you're writing at the moment or you're just focusing on your promotion at the moment? No, I'm writing at the moment. I was actually writing today. Um, promotions, 
publicity for this um, makes it sometimes difficult to focus on the new book, but um, I really want to get this. I've got these great ideas and I find if I don't write quickly, um, I lose the energy of the story. I don't know who said, I think it might be Stephen King maybe who said, you know, when you have a draft, try and get it finished as soon as possible. And I didn't do it with this book, with book three. I kind of left a big gap because I ended up developing Carpal Tunnel and I had to have like a two month break. Mm -hmm. And I had this two month break and I came back to the draft and I'd lost all the threads, like all of my passion for that story had gone. So right now, rather than just sitting back and enjoying this process, I'm like, no, nah, get me into the keyboard. I need to get these thoughts down on paper because I really love my readers. I want to honor my readers and everyone was so excited for the deep to come back that I just, I want to give them that same feeling again next year. I hope. And is your carpal tunnel fixed? Um, it is managed by a very expensive ergonomic keyboard. <laughs> so before I used to write everywhere, I used to write in cafes. I used to write in the car, write at lookouts, write at the beach. Um, that's part of the reason for the carpal tunnel. I just had really poor setup. Now um, I just have to write at a desk with my ergonomic keyboard and I'm okay. Well, that's good. I mean, that's good for us. That's good for you, but it's pretty <laughs> good for us. Um, do you think your films, your books might be made into films? <laughs> I mean, they're really, you know, anything exciting there happening? I can't, can neither confirm nor deny. Okay, well, we'll Catherine. just have to dream on and, uh, you know, maybe we'll be like, I wonder which one will happen first anyway, you know, that's... A I mean, I mean, what I can say is that if you have any... Oh, no, I can't even say that. If you have producer friends who might be interested in one of them, feel free to encourage them to reach out to Penguin. But um, if you have producer friends who are interested in another one... Um, it may be too late. <laughs> I don't these know. Things, yeah, these Who things knows? Take forever as well. I know you're lots of lots of books. There have been lots, by the way. There have been lots of terribly positive um, um, uh, references to your book. People saying thank you. I love your books. I'm going out to buy these immediately. You're wonderful. Just thought I'd tell you that. Oh, that's they're, great. They, they're not questions, so they've disappeared. But. Okay. Um, people saying I look forward to reading both books. Do you think those YA books might ever come back? Or are they, is it goodbye? No, 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 they'll be back for sure. Um, they'll be back for sure. I'm very interested to see how people respond to them when I do release them because that's actually what I thought I, you know, it's kind of more my natural, my more natural um, love, but that doesn't necessarily translate to good reading, Catherine, I've discovered. Just because I love something doesn't mean the readers do. Um, but they will come back eventually, not until... I'm contracted for at least two more of these um, thriller books, crime books, and then I'll keep doing more because I love them and I love my readers and I love the community and I've got so many more ideas. But yeah. I also have a lot of other ideas and a lot of other genres. So my goal as a creative is to get to the stage where I can do this full time. Mm -hmm. And the moment I'm in a state where I can do it full time, which is, you know, it's, it, it can be quite difficult. Um, not many writers at all, a very slim proportion of writers in Australia Absolutely. get to write full time. But I have a really good chance. Thank you to everyone who's supporting me. So when I finally get to the stage I transition into writing full time, um, I will definitely be doing my utmost to release uh, some of my young adult books. Great. Well, we look forward to it. We've loved We've absolutely loved. Um, I've loved talking to you today and I've loved you know both your books. And great covers. Do you have an input into the covers, just quickly? Not really. I mean, usually what happens is, uh, apparently, this hasn't happened to me, but usually you get offered a few different kind of covers and you get to vote on which one's your favourite and it goes back to the team. Um, in both cases, for me, um, they, my publisher basically came to me and said, I'm sorry, Kyle, but it's been a unanimous decision in the team that we've liked these covers. Please tell us that you like them too. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, my answer is like, are you kidding? Of course, they're amazing covers. Um, very atmospheric. Yeah, I'm very lucky. Well, look, it's been, we're going to be, we have to stop in just a couple of seconds. So thank you so much. It's been a really great time, a chance to talk and to find out more about the book and a really generous interview. So thank you for that. No, thank you, Catherine. We've had a great chat. I've really enjoyed this. 
great. I have loved joining you at this waterhole. What a lovely analogy, <laughs> using that again and again. Thank you for that. Um, I've actually got a colleague here watching tonight, Cla Claudia. Thank you so much for watching, Claudia. I didn't know you were signed up, but um, lovely, lovely to see you virtually. Um, we haven't been able to see each other in person for four weeks now. So um, nice, nice to have you here, Claudia. And um, I would like to say that we are recording this event. So if you do want to share it with your friends and family, we will be putting it up on um, uh, at the New South Wales Public Library uh, event YouTube channel, and we will send a link to you if you signed up through Eventbrite you will receive that link when it's available so please feel free to share it and um, watch it again and again and again because uh, th that's how we fill the watering hole isn't that right Kyle I'm that's gonna use exactly that forever right. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it um, <laughs> thank you so much Catherine for your time and your expert interviewing skills tonight and uh, Kyle uh, good luck with book three looking forward to it already I think um, I think everyone will be waiting for that release date. I know you've only just freshly put one out, but isn't that the, that's the, the world you live in. Everyone wants that book of year. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That, and I mean, again, it's, it's because of the community, the reading community, the online community that I get to do this. So my, I'm doing my utmost to deliver that on that expectation. And we have a lot of um, lovely, lovely comments and we will share those with you, Kyle and Catherine, um, after this event, we will send you a little report. So you won't miss all those lovely, kind words okay. from everybody. And uh, that's it. And, and and I know everyone's just got to go back and sit in their own front rooms or their <laughs> bedrooms or whatever. It's always so odd um, saying goodbye, but uh, um, that that is the world of Zoom. And we're very, very fortunate that we um, have this facility now in this. I think the, the pandemic was waiting for us to have a, a way to connect before it really hit us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that, that is that is it. I could stay waffling on forever, but um, farewell, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.